morning, everyone. It's time to go on the record. I think we should aspire to do that. I think we should aspire to deliver on that. The Baker administration struggling with repeated tragedies within DCF. Is this agency the problem that Governor Baker can't fix? The glove finger size amount is approximately 10 grams. And this is how fentanyl is increasingly trafficked. That's Attorney General Maura Healy coming down hard on fentanyl trafficking, leading on the opioid epidemic fight. Congressman Seth Moulton is our guest this morning. The growing ISIS threat, just one topic for the 6th District Democrat. And should the state require hands-free use only for cell phones and cars? We get reaction. From WCPB Boston, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ed Harding, along with New Center 5 political reporter Janet Wu. Thank you for joining us this morning on the record. Our guest is Seth Moulton. He is of the North Shore, the 6th District, the 6th Congressional District. He is with us this morning from Iran to ISIS to the papal visit. There is a lot to discuss this morning. Congressman, great to have you with us as always. Thank you, sir. Great Jen, to be back. You lead so on. there is a massive drug problem in Massachusetts right now, as you saw earlier this, um, um, just a few minutes ago, uh, the Attorney General referencing it. And it's revealing itself in too many homes. One example is the increase of DCF caseloads. Is there anything that can be done on the federal level? Well, I think that we have to look at uh, alternative programs like uh, like some of the things that are being pioneered in the 6th District. Uh, Chief Campanello up in Gloucester has an interesting idea. We need to make sure it's going to work, and uh, I know the uh, district attorney has expressed some reasonable concerns about it. Uh, but we've already seen 109 people turn themselves in uh, to the Gloucester police through this program. Uh, that said, there have been six deaths in Gloucester already. At the federal side, we need to make sure that police departments have the flexibility and funding to pursue alternate approaches because obviously what we've been doing to date simply hasn't worked. Uh, the, the, what you were referring to in Gloucester was, of course, uh, if people turn themselves in, no criminal prosecution, and they're, reference, they're sent to uh, some sort of uh, a therapy program or some sort of a program of some sort. Do you think that sort, uh, that sort of program should be extended throughout Massachusetts, at least as a pilot program? And, uh, no federal repercussions for a while? Well, I think it would be smart to try it as a pilot program in some other cities, but we need to make sure it works. And we really, it's too early to, to see the data to see if this is going to, if this is going to be uh, successful. I mean, one of the points that the DA makes, uh, uh, John Blodgett, uh, which I think is very smart, is it's not just about getting people into treatment, it's about how long they stay and whether or not they actually can come out and successfully uh, have gotten rid of their habits. Okay, let's, let's talk about Iran. Uh, just, just so we put you on the record, your, your vote for the president's Iran nuclear agreement is yay or nay? I support it because I think it's the best option that we have on the table today to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. All right, with that having been said, you've been going around the district explaining your decision, going to a temple in Marblehead to explain your decision, which obviously is a, is a, very, a very sensitive issue in terms of Israel. What are people telling you as you go around the district? I think people are saying that uh, there's a lot of support for the deal. Uh, there's also a lot of concern. And I am not someone who says that this is a perfect deal. I think it's an imperfect deal. But if you look at the other alternatives, either going to war immediately or trying to negotiate a better deal at the same time that all the sanctions are just falling apart, so we're losing all of our leverage, it's really the deal is really the only viable way forward at this point. I wish you, there well, was a better you, deal, you were but recently, there isn't. You were recently in Israel. That's right. I went to Israel. I heard from some of the international critics in chief of this agreement. Uh -huh. And to be honest, no one could present a viable alternative. No one could present a pathway to actually getting a better deal. So I actually found the conversations in Israel quite reaffirming. And we also met with some people in Israel who were supportive of the deal, including uh, several members of the Israeli Defense Forces who just think that this is the best way forward. Do you believe that the president's veto will be... Um uh, will be will he be able to hold it up in, in both both uh, houses? Well, I think that uh, he will be able to hold it up uh, in the House, but it's going to be close, and there are still a lot of Democrats who are thinking carefully. It really comes down to Democratic votes at this point, and there are a lot of my colleagues who are still thinking carefully about the deal. I'm having conversations with them to share uh, my views and answer some of their questions because I've gone into this in great detail. I didn't make a decision until I'd really conducted right. a considered analysis of all the different alternatives mm -hmm. and, and where they put us. If you, for example, even if you think that at the end of the day we're going to have to go to war with Iran, I, I hope that it doesn't come to that, but even if you think that's the case, we're still better off under the deal because we're going to have more international credibility, more domestic credibility to do so, to take a tough vote in Congress, and we'll have better intelligence about where all their weapons are. So the time frame uh, we're talking about is what? About a little less than a month from now. That's right, middle about of September. Right. Middle of exactly. September. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Right. Um, let's talk about ISIS. There seem to be more and more stories of seemingly um, unlikely young Americans being successfully recruited by ISIS. 
How do you explain this and how do you stop it? Look, I hate to sound like a broken record, but this is why we have to have a comprehensive strategy to defeat ISIS. It's not enough just to put some American military trainers on the ground in Iraq. We need to talk about the social media aspect that is infiltrating us right here at home. We need to talk about a political and diplomatic solution for Iraq where ISIS has blossomed uh, in the absence of a strong Iraqi government. And you know what? If the fundamental problem in Iraq is that Iraqi politics fell apart, that's why the army fell apart and that's why ISIS has been able to expand in Iraq, you don't fix Iraqi politics by training Iraqi troops. Let, let me ask you very specifically, we know that ISIS is using nerve gas that was originally from Syria. Is there anything the United States could slash should be doing now that it's, it, that it's not doing now that, that, that could perhaps stop this? One of the things I heard on my trip to Israel, and I heard this on when I went to Iraq and Afghanistan and other states in the Middle East, is that people are still looking for American leadership. Now that doesn't mean American troops on the ground, but we've got to provide a strategic vision for where things are going in the Middle East and how we're going to defeat ISIS. I like the fact that Jordan and UAE are conducting airstrikes against ISIS, so it's not just American planes or American troops, but they still need our strategic vision, and that's why I've been pressing the administration, pressing the president to come up with a serious, comprehensive plan to defeat ISIS and not just send a few more troops into Iraq. Uh, Pope Francis is uh, going to Washington. Uh, well, he's coming to the United States next month, and he's going to be speaking to Congress. This is going to be sort of a historic event. Do you think it's appropriate because there are some people that are saying that perhaps it's not the right thing for him to be doing? No, I do think it's appropriate because he is a world leader that millions of people respect. In fact, he has more influence than many uh, leaders of nations around the globe. So it's important that Congress uh, hear his views, and I'm looking forward to, to, to welcoming him to Washington. And you're allowed one guest and to bring into, and who, who's, your, who's your guest? The guest that I invited uh, was the priest who was with my company uh, in the Najaf Cemetery in Iraq in 2004. It was a brutal battle. Uh, there were Marines getting wounded and, and, and killed left and right. And fearlessly, he walked among our positions. He had no... Uh, no regard for his own safety, uh, but took care of me and my fellow Marines. He was a true hero of that battle, and it's an honor to invite him to join me. Good what choice, and also it avoids the argument between mom and dad, doesn't it? That's right. That's <laughs> Wait, right. What's his name? What's his name? Uh, Father Paul Shaughnessy. Thank you. I and he's originally from Worcester. I wanted to get the... Cause and he's got a great Worcester yeah. accent, so uh, I hope he comes. He hasn't accepted yet. Uh, he's actually currently stationed in, a, in Amman, Jordan, uh, doing the Lord's work overseas, mm -hmm. and so we've got to see if he can mm -hmm. come home, but I certainly would be honored to have him. You ready for the OTR pop quiz? All right. Is here we one go. ever ready for the OTR pop quiz? Question one. For the first time in 54 years, the Stars and Stripes is flying over the U.S. Embassy in Havana. When did Secretary of State John Kerry say the U.S. Cuba talks on full normalization will begin? When will the talks on full normalization begin? Uh, to be perfectly honest, this happened when I was in Israel, and I, and I don't know. I don't know what he said. Just about a month from now, early to mid-September okay. is, is the time frame that he presented. Question two. Which prominent GOP presidential candidate called Kerry's visit to Cuba, and I'm quoting here, a birthday present for Fidel Castro, a symbol of the Obama administration's acquiescence to this ruthless legacy? You know, I didn't hear that, uh, that either. Uh, I'd have to guess uh, Donald Trump, because he seems to get the, the best quotes in the news you're, these you're, days. You're but... in the right party, but it's Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush, is that John, right? Okay. Yeah, me, he, and Marco Rubio, the son of an anti-Castro Cuban immigrant, is also very critical as well. We continue on the record with Seth Moulton. Stay with us.